Well, good morning, everybody. You, uh, you look good this morning. It's so good to see you guys. Hey, can you do me a favor right now, and can you welcome everybody that is watching us online? We are so glad that you joined us this morning. Uh, so thankful for the technology, uh, just because there's a bunch of people uh, living back home in the great state of Alabama who are getting to watch us right now. And so I'm, I'm so thankful uh, for you guys watching. Uh, thank you, Lord, uh, just for the way that you raised me, uh, growing up family and friends uh, through the church. And so just really glad that we have the technology uh, so that you guys can watch this morning. Uh, well, it is the last Sunday before school starts, everybody. School starts tomorrow. Didn't know if you knew that. If you knew that, didn't know that, I uh, might need to go to Walmart and get school supplies or something like that uh, after church today. Uh, school starts tomorrow. And so, man, it's just been an incredible Incredible summer. Uh, we started off uh, specifically in our family ministry, and so back in June, uh, we took uh, 55 students to uh, to Coa Falls, Georgia, uh, for a student camp, and then it, it went on into July. In July, we had Adventure Week, uh, where we, you know, almost 350 kids walked through our doors over in Lake Nona High School, uh, just reaching elementary school kids. And then at the end of the month of July, just a couple weeks ago, we took another group of 55 students uh, to Birmingham, Alabama, for Motion Conference. And so it's just been, it's been an incredible summer. It's been a busy summer uh, in family ministry. As a matter of fact, Hannah and I just got back uh, from, from vacation. We went away for vacation for a week, and uh, we are back, though. We are well-rested and ready to take on the fall season. Uh, rest is good for the, the soul, everybody. And so we are ready for the fall season, though. And uh, just a lot of things coming up in the upcoming fall season. Uh, Life Groups, uh, which you know is the heartbeat of our church. Uh, Life Groups are the heartbeat of our church. They launch September 3rd, so we're getting ready. We're almost there. We're kicking up. As a matter of fact, uh, starting the, or this week, right after service uh, in the Orange Room, you'll have Life Group leadership training. And so just moving all the way up until September 3rd, we'll launch Life Groups. And then we started off this fall season. This past Sunday, we kicked off 21 Days of Prayer. And uh, it's just an incredible, incredible time. If you've ever, if you've ever been a part, uh, whether you've just, maybe whether you've already been in this 21 days, uh, whether you've been in the past, maybe you came back in January, or you've been in years past, you know uh, that this 21 days of prayer it, it is a powerful time. And so, if you've never been, I encourage you. I encourage you to come. I encourage you to take some time and come. Just give God the first part of your morning. And, and it's just, it's not just for adults. It's for everybody. Um, as a matter of fact, um, I was at a family's house on Monday night talking and. Uh, there's just, his name is uh, Mercer, and he's actually sitting right here on the front row right now. Um, but he is, uh, he's in fifth grade. He's about to go into sixth grade. And so I was hanging out over there on Monday night, and uh, he said, uh, I want to go to prayer in the morning. And so he was talking to his mom, asking to pick him up or to take him. And, you know, finally I just said, you know what, so you want me to come pick you up? And he said, yeah, that, can you, Mom, can he do that? And I said, I'll come pick you up, but this is the thing. I'm going to be at your house at 530. If you're not outside... On the driveway, when I pull in, I am never coming to get you again. So you better be, I got a text at 515, said I'm in the driveway waiting. <laughs> and so he came on Tuesday morning, and then he missed Wednesday morning. And so I got a text from his mom on Wednesday morning, and uh, he said he is so upset. He told me that if I can't take him tomorrow morning, that he's riding his bike to church so he can come to prayer. And so uh, he made it on Wednesday. It's been a great uh, it's been a great time, and so I encourage you uh, to be a part of 21 Days of Prayer because it, it really is just going into this fall season, uh, especially getting ready. If you have kids going back into school, just they're, that's the beginning of their new school year, and so just really laying down the foundation, laying the foundation of prayer going into this fall season. And so what better way uh, to go hand in hand with 21 Days of Prayer uh, than starting a series on prayer and, and, and then a spiritual battle that we face. Called, and, and so this series title we have started, uh, started last week is War Room, and I encourage you uh, if you're in the room or you're watching online and you missed part one, go back la and, and watch last week's message. Uh, and then if you can't miss next week, or if you miss next week, go back and finish. Let's, let's, let's watch this whole series as a whole. And so it's an incredible, incredible series. I'm so thankful uh, just that Pastor Rodney asked me uh, to be a part of this series and share with you guys. And mainly just because uh, this is something that I take very seriously in my life. Um, it's a very, uh, it's, it's something that I, I don't, I take very seriously. As a matter of fact, it, it kind of fires me up a little bit just because, like, I don't like when the devil messes with people. Like, don't mess with my life. Don't mess with the church's life. And I don't like it when they it messes with your life. It hurts me when, they, when, they, when the enemy wants to hurt you. And, and so it's a, very, it's a very serious topic, and, and I take it very seriously. And, and it kind of, sometimes it fires me up a little bit. So this morning, if I get fired up during the message, I'm just going to need you to get fired up with me. Can you do that? All right. I'm going to hold you to it. I'm going to hold you to it. I promise. And so but it's, it's just a very real, it's a very real thing. A lot of people don't think that spiritual warfare, uh, a lot of believers, as a matter of fact, don't believe that spiritual warfare is a real thing. And it is a 100% an absolute 
real thing. Uh, Pastor Chad talked about it already, uh, but and what happened yesterday in Charlottesville, that's, that, uh, what's going on in America, that's spiritual warfare. What's going on, what happened yesterday, that's a spiritual thing. Racism is a sin issue. It's a spiritual battle, and it's a real thing. In our country, we need to realize it, and we need, we need to bring it up, and we need to talk about it, and we need to go face the enemy, and we need, and we need to know who our God is. And so this, this morning, we're going we're gonna to walk in through a little bit of it. We're going to start talking through the armor of God, as Pastor Rodney shared uh, last week at the end of his message. He said that we're going uh, to go through the armor of God. And we're just going to talk how we, uh, as individuals, can face the enemy day in and day out and what God has given us to face the enemy and how we can take that into our prayer life and, and take it into our war room, into, into your room where you go to battle with the enemy in your prayer life. And, and so this morning, what, we're, what I want to do first is, is just kind of talk about that we got a couple of theme verses that Pastor Rodney shared a little bit, and it's just talking about kind of where the spiritual warfare comes from, that it is a real thing. And so the first, the first verse I want to highlight is in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, in verse 3 and 4, it says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds, spiritual strongholds. And then the second verse is in Ephesians chapter 6. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. That's what we're going to talk about today. So that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Not the, not the earth schemes, the devil's schemes. It's a spiritual battle. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. There you go. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against humans. Listen to me this morning. Your str- our struggle, what's going on in Charlottesville yesterday, it's not against flesh and blood. It's not. Our, our battles are not against our government. Our battle is not against the, our president. It says it's not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Those are some powerful words. Rulers. And dark world, those are some, those are some, some powerful words talking about uh, a, a realm. As a matter of fact, this, this is what that last word, the last two words, it's a heavenly realm. There, there is another realm that's going on right now that's not what you're living in. It's not what you're seeing. There's an earthly realm that we live, but there is another realm that exists, and, and that is that there is a heavenly realm. It, it is a real thing. There is a heavenly realm realm. There is stuff going on that is not on this earth that, that is a spiritual battle. And, and we have to realize it and we have to face it. We can't ignore it. We have to go straight at it that there is a heavenly realm. There is a spiritual battles going on and we have to face it. As a matter of fact, we have to face it because the Bible says that we have to face it. In Ephesians 5, it says that I have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. The Bible tells us to expose the spiritual battle, to expose the darkness. We're not supposed to just ignore it. There is a heavenly realm, and we are supposed to expose it. And so this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to walk through uh, the first part of the armor of God in just a few minutes. And Pastor Rodney's going to close us out next week with the last half of the armor of God. But before we get there this morning, I just want to re- real quick uh, go back through last week, in case you missed it, what Pastor Rodney talked about a little bit. He, Pastor Rodney talked about the enemy. He talked about the devil a little bit. And so real quickly, I, just, I wrote down four things that I want you to write down this morning. I encourage you to take notes, open up the app. Uh, it, is a brand, it is a brand new app. It's not just an update. Uh, so there is a new app called Rethink Life Church if you download it from the app store. And uh, so it, it has a much better way of taking notes. And so I encourage you to take notes today. But I just wrote down four things uh, just to real quick wrap up Pastor Rodney's message last week. And the first one is, is that the devil is real. The devil is real. It is a, it's a real thing. Okay? The devil's not a fairy tale. Like the devil is real, and it talks about it. Uh, it and as a matter of fact, in the Bible, it says that Jesus saw the devil cast out of heaven. And he says he saw it like a lightning strike. Like there was no struggle. There was no battle. It was like, boom, it's done. He's, he is now cast it out of heaven. And then it's recorded in Scripture again in Revelation. In Revelation chapter 12, it says, Then war broke out in heaven. I would love to see a war break out. I think that would be the coolest thing to see a war break out in heaven. It says, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon against his angels fought back. 
but come on, here we go. But he was not strong enough. Come on, everybody. The devil, guess what? He was not strong enough. Aren't you thankful for that this morning? Aren't you thankful that the devil is not strong enough? And they lost their place in heaven. And it says they because, because the devil, not just himself, but a third of the angels were casted out with him. That's why it's plural. It says they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down that the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Take note of that. He was hurled to the earth. So that means he is here amongst us. So that means he has the capability of tapping into our lives. And, and so that's why we know that the second thing that I wrote down is that the devil is at war with us. The devil is at war with us. Pastor Rodney talked about that last week, how the devil, he, his, his goal is to destroy your life. His goal is to take you off of God's plan for your life and to destroy you. That's what he wants to do. So we know that the devil is at war, of us, at war with us, and we also know that the devil has power. The devil has power. So that means if you allow him, that means he can get into your life. He can get a stronghold. He can get a foothold on your life if you let him creep in. And then he has power. He has power to destroy you if you let him creep in. But this is the best part. The last one is, is that even though all those things, the devil submits to our God. That it doesn't matter. At the, at the end of the day, he got casted out of heaven. At the end of the day, he no longer is in control. That God already defeated him. That the, he submits to our God. As a matter of fact, in 1 John 4, 4, it says, you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them. Guess what? We are from God and we have overcome. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. God is in me, and so therefore I, I can defeat the devil. I can. He has to submit to our God because of the price that he paid, because of what Jesus did. We have victory inside of Jesus, and that means the devil cannot control our lives. He has to submit to our God. And so this morning, what I want to do is I want to walk through what God has given us, what God has given us to conquer the devil with. And, and that's the armor of God. He, he has given us the armor of God. And so what we're going to do is we're going to walk through Ephesians 6, uh, verses 13 through 17. And so uh, today we're going to talk about the first three. And like I said uh, uh, earlier, Pastor Rodney, he's going to talk about the last three next week. And so it says, it says, Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, evil's coming. <laughs> There's no way around it. It's like, be more positive. Or I'm positive it's coming. <laughs> be more, there is an evil day that's going to come. You may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then, and here we go, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, waist with a breastplate of righteousness in place, that's the second one, and with your feet filled with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, that's the third one. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, that's the fourth one, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the fifth one, and the sword of the Spirit, number six, which is the word of God. God has given us six pieces of armor. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the first three. We're going to talk about the first three pieces of the armor of God. And so it says to stand firm in these things. So we're going to stand firm. And so the first one that we're going to talk about today is the belt of truth. The belt of truth is the first thing that we're going to talk about today. And so what you, what you need to understand uh, today uh, about, about the armor of God is, that, is, is who is writing. Okay, so Paul is writing this in Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, so hopefully today maybe you, you may learn something. So, uh, but Paul is writing this in Ephesians chapter 6. And so what Paul is doing while he's writing this is he's in a jail cell. Paul is in prison right now. And, and he is writing Ephesians chapter 6. And so when Paul is writing this and talking about the armor of God, uh, Paul is looking for an illustration. And so Paul uses his eyes on what he can see to write off the armor of God. And so what Paul can see is a Roman soldier. What Paul can see is a Roman soldier, and he can see the Roman soldier's outfit. And so all of the, all of the armor of God, all of these, uh, these illustrations come based off of what Paul can see. And so what he can see is the Roman soldier. And so he's in prison. And what you need to know about a Roman soldier is how they were dressed. And so what a Roman soldier was wearing was a long toga. A long toga that, that was, and a belt was wrapped around their long toga. And it wasn't just a normal belt. It was like a utility belt. It, it, had, it had purpose. It, that, that belt held the rest of his outfit, the rest of his armor 
together. It, it, was kind of the, it was kind of the main focus of his entire armor was his belt. And, and not only that, but they had, it, was a, it wasn't just a toga that was like shorts. It was like went all the way down to their feet. It was a long toga. And so what the belt did is they could take that toga and, and they could pull it up and they could tuck it into their belt. That way they had the freedom to move. That way they could actually go to battle and they could run and, and they could move instead of wearing a dress. And I don't even want to try to run a dress. I've never done it before. I don't want to try. But he, he could tuck in the belt and now, he, now they had the freedom to move. This belt was the most important aspect of their gear. It was a utility belt. Uh, kind of like, uh, you, you, you know, you got superheroes. And so superheroes have superpowers. Well, Batman, he didn't actually have superpowers, but he was a superhero and he had a utility belt. Batman had a utility belt. He, he would conquer the Joker and everybody else with, with the things based off his belt. Uh, my favorite thing that he always would pull from the belt, he'd, he had this thing he would it'd like shoot and then catch onto the building uh, with a hook, and then he'd press the button and it would like attract him to what thing because he couldn't really fly. But it would attract him to where he was, and so I, that was my favorite one. But he had a utility belt, and then also I meant like a police officer. A police officer, they have a utility belt. Uh, their gun, their flashlight. Um, their taser, their handcuffs, all of that is in on their belt, is utility belt. Without that, they're, they're just standing in a uniform. <laughs> and so, but they have, they have all these weapons that are around and, and connected to the utility belt. And so it was a utility belt for the Roman soldier. And, and for the belt of truth for us, the belt of truth is our utility belt. The, the belt of truth is our most important aspect of our gear. And, and why do we need this? Why do we need the belt of truth? We need the belt of truth because the enemy likes to come at, come at us with a bunch of lies. The enemy likes to lie to us. The enemy likes to tell us things that aren't really true, but the enemy wants to creep up into our minds by telling us uh, the, the things like you're not good enough and, and, and things like, oh, you can't do this. That's a, he tries to put lies inside of us. And so we need the truth. We need the truth to stand on. We, we need the belt of truth to stand on so we can conquer the lies of the enemy. But what is the truth, though? It's like, stand on the belt of truth. Well, what's the truth? Well, I, there's no better way to look and see what the truth is than to find it in Scripture. And so there's two pieces of Scripture that I want to point out that tells us exactly what the truth is. And so the first one is in Ephesians chapter 4. It says, when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. The truth that is in Jesus. And then the other verse comes out of John chapter 14, verse 6. It says, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. So Jesus himself, he said, I am the way and the truth. So what is the truth? The truth is Jesus. The truth is Jesus. Jesus is the truth. And so therefore, if Jesus is the truth, that means that we can use Jesus as a weapon to fight against the enemy. We can use the name of Jesus to fight against the enemy. Why? Because the name of Jesus has power. The name of Jesus has power. You know, today's song selection, Pastor Nick, he, t he asked me on Monday, he said, is there a song that, that goes with your message? I said, absolutely. He said, let's play Tremble. Because it says, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Your name is a light that the shadows can't deny. Your name cannot be overcome. Jesus' name has power. Jesus' name is a powerful name. But why does his name have power? Why does his name have power? Because names have power. Names themselves have power. Think about it. Depression, it has power. The word addiction that's a powerful name. Debt, that's a powerful name. The word cancer, that's a really powerful name. You know, my mom just got wa done walking through a season where, of breast cancer. But the first time she called me and said that she had it, that was, I had all kinds of emotions going on. Because cancer is a powerful name. Names have power. But there is a name that is above all of those names. There is a name that is greater than all of those names. And that's the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is greater than every name. Look what it says in Philippians chapter 2. 
It says, therefore God exalted him to the highest place, the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name. Come on, church. Are you thankful for the name of Jesus? It's the name above every name. It doesn't matter what situation, what name is, is trying to claim you. I, cancer can't claim you. Debt can't claim you. Addiction can't claim you. Depression can't claim you. The name of Jesus can claim you, and it is above every one of those names. The name of Jesus has power. And to kind of illustrate it to you, I, I was thinking about, like, uh, when I was a kid, so when I was a kid, you know, I'd be upstairs, you know, maybe I was playing video games or something like that. And so it's like, it's dinner time. And so uh, my brother or sister, they'd like run upstairs and be like, hey, it's time for dinner. And I'd be playing video games and like look at them and okay, and just keep looking at the TV and keep playing. So they'd go back downstairs and then come back up in a few minutes and say, hey, dad said it's time for, uh, for dinner. And I'd be like, pause, okay, I'm coming. Because names have power. You use a certain name and the name has power. Jesus has power. His name is power. So we ourselves have the name of Jesus to use as a weapon. And so how do we use it? So we have the belt of truth. How do we use the name of Jesus? Well, it's real simple. In Romans chapter 10, here's what it says. In Romans chapter 10, this is what it says. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Come on, all you got to do is call on the name of the Lord. Call on the name of Jesus in your prayer life. And, and, and you find out, you've got, you find out a relative's got cancer. Lord, today, in the name of Jesus, cancer is not victorious. In the name of Jesus, enemy, you have to flee. Cancer has to flee the body because Jesus paid the price. In the name of Jesus, I, today I stand on the truth that is in him. And cancer, you cannot win that battle. And so that's how you use the name of Jesus. That's how you stand on with the belt of truth in your prayer life. And so then the second thing that we have to, we have to put on, it says the breastplate of righteousness. So it says to put on the breastplate of righteousness and have it in place. And so for this Roman soldier, they had a breastplate on. And so for this Roman soldier, their breastplate covered their front side and their back side. Uh, so maybe you've been, you, you've heard before, and you think when you think about a breastplate, oh, it just covers your chest. Or maybe you've even heard it talk about a breastplate before, and you think it was only the front side. Uh, well, if you do some research and you look back, the breastplate, the breastplate of a Roman soldier if you look back in those times and you do some studying, it covered their whole torso. Their breastplate covered their whole torso. So it did cover their front side and their back side. And so to look at the breastplate of righteousness, for us, we first have to know what righteousness is. We have to know where righteousness is and, and what righteousness means. And so today there's, there's two different types of righteousness that I want to point out. And, and so the first one that I want to point out is, is practical. And, and, that, and it just straight up, it's just Practical righteousness. So, so what, is that, what does practical righteousness mean? Well, practical righteousness is pure and holy living. Practically, like how you're living your life out, it is pure, it is holy. You're striving to look like Jesus when you live your life. It is a lifestyle that you live in a practical way. And, and it's not because we have to do it. It's not because it's the law. It's not, we don't have any legalistic bond to it. It's because we, we live our life pure and holy because of the price that Jesus paid for us on the cross. I live out my life practically and, and try to strive to look like Jesus because of my love relationship with God. Because I love Jesus, therefore, I want to live a pure and holy lifestyle for him. That's the least that I can do if he's going to pay for every one of my sins. And so it, when I was in pre, when I was, when Hannah and I were getting married, we were in premarital, uh, we had, uh, we were walking through premarital and we had a task uh, to write 15 expectations uh, for each other in marriage. 15 expectations. I had 15 expectations I wrote down for her. She had 15 expectations that she wrote down for me. And so we both hang on to those. Uh, mine sits in my Bible. And, but those 15 things, I don't, I don't strive to do those 15 things because she wrote them on a piece of paper. And now it's law. 
like taking the trash out is not the law of my marriage. I do those 15 things because I love her to death. I do those 15 things because how much I love my wife and I want my marriage to be better and I want to strive for my marriage to be better every day. It's out of a love relationship. And that's the same thing where you live your life out righteously. When you live in a righteous way, it's because of your love relationship with God. You want to love God. You love God and you want to be more like Him. You want to, look, you want to be closer to Jesus every day because you love Him so much. And so you, that, therefore you live it out in a practical way. You live life out in a practical way. There's a verse in Romans chapter 12. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Holy and pleasing to God. Look at what it says this. This is your true and proper worship. Practical righteousness is an act of worship. Worship is more, worship is absolutely singing songs and worshiping Him on a Sunday morning, but it's more than that. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship is the life that you live. Living a pure and holy life for God is an act of worship. Practical righteousness. And then the second one is positional righteousness. So we have practical righteousness and positional righteousness. And so what positional righteousness is, is just how God sees you. It's how God views you. It's, it's, it's the way that God looks at you. And so what you need to know this morning is that this is your identity maker. This right here, your positional righteousness, this is your identity. And so this all comes from the price that Jesus paid for you on a cross. It's the work that happened on the cross. When Jesus died for you, that's how now, now because of the, way that G, the price that Jesus paid, now God views you through his blood. God declares you righteousness through his son, Jesus. Jesus is now inside of you. So now, therefore, God looks at you through the lens of Jesus. You are righteousness because of his son. He no, he no longer looks at you as a sinner, but he looks at you as a righteous person. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, God made him who had no sin... Made him who had no sin. That's Jesus. To be sin for us. Thank you, Lord, for saving me for my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for paying for my sins. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So because of the price that Jesus paid, we might become the righteousness of God. Now get this, everybody. Because of all of this, you are just as acceptable as Jesus. You are just acceptable as Jesus. Because of the price that he played, paid, the blood that he shed, now God sees you through the lens of the blood of Jesus. And so now you can stand next to Jesus and God looks at you as the same. And the best part of this is, is it's a permanent mark on your life. It is permanent. There is no sin you could fall into. There is not one single thing that you could do that could ever take away that view of God on your life. He sees you through the lens of the blood of Jesus. He sees you just as he would see his own personal son. You are, can stand firm and know who you are in Christ. And why do we need it? Why do we need the breastplate of righteousness? We need the breastplate of righteousness because the devil likes to play with our emotions. The devil likes to play with our lives. He likes, he likes to play with our emotions, and so we need the breastplate of righteousness. Because when he says things like, oh, you're not good enough, oh, you can't do it, and he wants to toy with our emotions, we stand firm on the truth that we know who we are in Christ, our position in Christ. You know, the devil really does like to play with our emotions, just like people does. You know, if you're single in the room, it's just like, like, can you tell me if you like me or not? <laughs> like, just quit toying with me. It's just, yeah, I do like you, or no, I don't. And if you're married, it's like, did I do it the right way? Or like, did I not do it the right way? Like, can you just tell me, can you stop playing with our emotions? You know, the, people like to play with our emotions, and so does, so does the devil. And so we need the breastplate of righteousness in us. In 1 first, in first Timothy in chapter 6, it says, but flee from these things. 
you man of God, and pursue righteousness. Flee from these things. Flee from the emotions. The devil's trying to play with your emotions. The enemy's trying to play with your emotions. Flee from these things is what it says in 1 Timothy. And pursue righteousness. We must declare who we are in Jesus' name and stand in the position that we have because of the price that Jesus paid. And we can't just stand in it. We have to live it out practically. They go hand in hand. You can't do one without the other. You not only have to know who you are in Christ, in your position, but you have to live it out in a practical way. Why? Because if you only stand in your positional and you don't live it out practically, then this is the thing. If you don't live it out practically, then you give the enemy, you give him a chance to get into your life. If you don't live it out practically, now you've opened yourself up for the enemy to come in into your life. There's an opportunity for him to get a stronghold on your life. And, and so for, for us to not allow that to happen, we have to live it out practically, but we also have to stand in our position of righteousness. And how does this apply to our prayer life? How do we take this into our war room? Well, when the devil's coming out, out with us with our emotions, when he's trying to tell us we're not good enough, when he's trying to tell us we can't do it, and he's playing with our emotions, we stand firm on who we are. Enemy, today you cannot come into my life and you cannot play with my emotions because Jesus paid a price and God sees me as righteousness. I am good enough because of the price that Jesus paid. Don't tell me I'm not, enemy, because you are a liar. And so we stand, we stand on the breastplate of righteousness. We put it on and we go to battle with the enemy. And so we have the belt of truth and we put on the breastplate of righteousness. And then the last thing we're going to talk about today is the gospel boots. So we have a belt, we have a breastplate, and we have boots. They all start with B. I did it on purpose. Hopefully you can remember them all. But we have, it says, to, 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 it says with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. So this Roman soldier, they're putting on their sandals. And, and in that time, a Roman soldier, he had sandals on that he would put on. And they weren't just like normal sandals, like normal flip-flops. They, they were sandals, but they were the cool sandals because, listen to this, they had spikes on the bottom of them. So this Roman soldier, he had sandals, but they had spikes on the bottom. So they were like the coolest sandals you could get. And it's kind of like um, I have a pair of, uh, of Chaco sandals. It's a type of sandal. Uh, evidently, it's not the cool thing to wear those in Florida. Um, I wore those one time around our students, and they made fun of me the entire time that I wore them. Um, but there, it's a sandal, and so it's just kind of like me wearing those sandals and, and then taking spikes and putting them on the bottom of them. And so what the spikes did is it gave them traction. It gave them gripping power so they could move around and go to battle. It was kind of a key piece. It was kind of a foundational piece for this Roman soldier because without their feet, they can't move. Without your feet, you can't move. So you can't go to battle and move around if you can't move around on your feet. You have to have some gripping power. You, you have to have a piece that you can that you can stand on and you can make a hard cut. You know, like I, I cannot stand when I have to play a sport and wear the wrong shoes. Like I cannot stand having to play football and not wearing cleats. Has anybody ever played football and worn tennis shoes and like busted their tail? Like three of you in this room. <laughs> I ha cannot stand wearing tennis shoes when I play football. I want to have cleats. That way when I make a, a hard cut and I step this way, my body doesn't go flying, and I can go back the other way, and I can grip into the ground. I don't even like playing basketball in tennis shoes. I like being able, at one, to make the squeaky sound on the gym floor, but two, I like being able to make a hard cut if I need to. I, like, I cannot stand wearing the wrong shoes. And so for a Roman soldier, it, it, was, it was foundational that they needed their shoe because with this shoe, they had stability. They had a foundation, and they had a gripping power. And so for us, with our gospel boots, we have stability, we have a foundation, and we have a gripping power in Christ. But not only that, we also have a peace. We have a peace because we carry the gospel of peace. Now you say, what is the gospel? Maybe you're in church this morning, you've never been here before, and you have no idea what the actual gospel, the word gospel means. Well, here's what the, the word gospel means. The gospel is the death the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. The gospel is your salvation. The gospel is the power of the cross. 
And this is the one that the, the enemy, he cannot stand. The devil cannot stand this one because, because it is the very thing that defeated him. When Jesus died on the cross, it was the very thing that defeated him. So he cannot stand this one. You know, when Jesus, when, when he died on the cross, from the moment between the death and the resurrection, there was some confrontation that happened. You know, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of people, they believe that, that, you know, just when Jesus died on the cross, that, that, that he defeated the enemy. Yes, that is true, but there's more to it. Jesus, when he died, before he resurrected, he descended to the lower parts of the earth. It says that in, in Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians 4, it tells us that he descended to the lower parts of the earth. And why did he go to the lower parts of the earth? For you, for me, for us. He went to confront the devil. And from the moment that he died to the moment he resurrected, he went down, he, he went down to the lower parts of the earth, and he said, uh, hey, devil, I just paid the ultimate price for each and every one of these people. So hand over the keys. Give me those keys. You don't have them anymore. I have them. Give them to me. So he took the keys before, in the moment between he died and he resurrected. He snatched the keys from the devil. And it, even, and it even records it in Scripture. Maybe you've never even seen this, but in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, it says, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. This is Jesus and the resurrection, because he says, I am he, he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Jesus just amen himself. Come on, y'all can help me out a little bit sometimes. If he does it to himself, come on now. But he says, and I have the keys of not, look, look at this, not just Hades, but of death. Even death doesn't have victory over your life. Because of the price that Jesus paid, even death does not have victory over your life. Jesus said, give me the keys. Give me the keys because you can't have them. I just paid the ultimate price. So anything that you throw at me, it's already been won. And you can declare that over the enemy every day in your life. Jesus, it, it, you know, enemy, it doesn't matter what you throw at me today. Jesus paid for my sins on the cross, so today I have victory over you. Enemy, you can't come into my life today because I already have victory over you. It doesn't matter what battle you bring to me. I already know the end result. I've already won. So it doesn't matter what trial you take me through. It doesn't matter what tragedy happens. At the end of the day, I know the end result. So enemy, you can't have a place in my life today. And then the other part of this, uh, of this, of this gospel boots is it says the readiness, fitted with the readiness. What does that mean? It just means you're ready to move. It means you're ready to go to battle. You're ready to share. Because that's how we use our gospel. That's how we use the boots of the gospel. That's why we need to be fitted with them. We need, to, we need it and we use it. We use it by just sharing the gospel. Sharing the story of Jesus. Declaring in your prayer life, here I am God, I'm ready, send me. Let me go carry the gospel to somebody else. And if you don't know how to tell the story of the gospel, just share your story. Just share your personal story. Because each and every one of you, when you share your story, you share the gospel. Because you share, at one point, you were going, you were going to the lower parts of the earth to pay for your own sins. But Jesus came into my life, and now I'm spending eternity with him. At one point, every one of us, we needed to be rescued. At one point, every one of us were living in an area where we need to be rescued. But God came into play in our life, and He changed us, and transformed us, and radically saved us. And so by sharing our story, we share the gospel. There's a verse in Revelation chapter 12. It says, they have defeated Him. So you want to defeat the enemy? They have defeated him by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus, and by their testimony. 
Your testimony defeats the enemy. So go share your testimony. Why do we need to go share our testimony? Because if we don't go share our testimony, if we don't go share the gospel, then that means there's people outside these doors that don't ever get a chance to experience God. There's people outside these doors who have to go pay for their own sins because we never took the gospel to them. We never shared Christ with them. So we have to be ready to walk and, and be ready to go every time with the gospel, carrying the gospel with us. So we have to put on the belt of truth. We have to put on the breastplate of righteousness. And then we have to be, have our feet fitted with our gospel boots. And if we do that, we can go to battle with the enemy every day. Do you believe it? Come on, let's pray. Father God, I thank you for today.